Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Deb Clemens, representing the RISD Museum. If you have any needs throughout this program, please let me know in the chat and I will try to assist. Excited to gather today for Double Take Art and Disability. We are recording this session um, with the hopes of sharing it widely. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Connor Moynihan, the museum's Mellon Curatorial Fellow in Prince Drawings and Photographs now. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Connor Moynihan, the, the Mellon Curatorial Fellow in Prince Drawings and Photographs at RISD Museum. And welcome tonight. I'm thrilled to see uh, how many people have tuned in for this conversation. Um, and I just want to sort of introduce everyone that will be here today. So it, it, today will be a conversation between myself and Leon Hilton, who is the Assistant Professor of Theatre Arts and Performance Studies at Brown University. And we are assisted today by Heather Anderson and Rain Tupacat uh, with uh, ASL interpretation uh, throughout tonight's conversation. Um, and I just want to take a little bit to sort of introduce how this conversation came about and a little bit about how I'm approaching it before I pass it off to Leon. Um, but I, so I joined RISD as the fellow a year ago and I'm working on at the end of my fellowship an exhibition that will look at the permanent collection uh, for works on paper. And I wanted to explore representation of disability. And this last year has really been spent sort of looking through our collection, looking at works of paper, and really finding representations of disability, and thinking about when and where we see disability represented and what it means in that context. And that's really sort of the, the crux of my research right now for this project. Um, and so I'm really excited today to sort of share some of my initial findings as I, I plan out this exhibition, and also focus more specifically on uh, neurodiversity and mental disability uh, in conversation with Leon Hilton. Um, so I'm going to conclude there and pass it off to Leon Hilton. Great. Um, thank you so much, Connor. Um, it's really a pleasure to be in conversation with you um, this evening. Um, I'm very, very excited um, to hear about um, the plans for an exhibition um, that you are in the midst of kind of planning, drawing on RISD's, kind of in, the RISD Museum's incredible collection. Um, I think this is a really important and timely topic to uh, be sort of thinking about and, and discussing together. Um, and um, I think, you know, I'm just excited to see how sort of my research, which really does focus on um, performance, uh, right now it's like really looking at the concept of uh, uh, neurodiversity in relationship to, to performance and visual art and forms of representation. So um, I think we'll, um, you know, see how the conversation goes. I'm really excited to talk about all the pieces that you've kind of selected from the collection today. I think there's like a lot to be said. Um, and I'm also looking forward to being in conversation with folks um, through the, the chat or through Q&A as we go. So um, maybe, uh, yeah, I'll stop there and see uh, where you want to start us off. Great, and then just a little, a few notes about the format. So Leon and I will discuss for about 45 minutes, we're gonna look at four works of art. Um, and then we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. So uh, during the, our, our conversation, if you could just keep your screens um, uh, off and, and, and your voice muted, uh, and then save that for when we get to the Q&A. If you have a question, turn on your screen and unmute, and then we can, we can go from there. But throughout, if you have a question or a thought as we're talking, drop it in the chat, and if we can uh, address it in real time, we can and will. Um, but this is meant to be very conversational and, uh, and I hope to, to keep the spirit of that program going. <laughs> so I will try to discuss a little bit what we're looking at before diving into the work. So right now we're looking at an engraving. Uh, we see an interior scene with a, a, a figure on the floor in the foreground being shackled. And we have see a variety of rooms in the background with, with different um, predominantly male figures um, looking at objects such as a cross or wearing a crown, um, just different sort of scenes. This is a, um, an engraving by William Hogarth. It is the, it's from a suite of paintings that he did that he then produced engravings uh, afterwards called The Rake's Progress. 
Um, and I'm just going to give a little bit of background on that story and why I'm starting here uh, for this work, because um, the Rake's progress is it's a morality tale. It's a satire and it follows the story of Tom Rakewell. And Tom Rakewell uh, was born to a uh, recently wealthy family. His father made money um, as a merchant. And but Tom Rakewell was then born into money. His father earned his money and Tom Rakewell uh, inherited that money. So after his father passed, uh, Hogarth sort of tracks his trajectory from inheriting his wealth, uh, extravagant spent, extravagantly spending it, and ultimately leading, ultimately leading to his demise. So it's, a, it's, it's this chart, that, you know, this trajectory where we, you know, we see him inherit his money and then the demise from that money. And this is the final plate, the final series. And the, the end for Tom is in um, the Bethlehem um, um, Hospital, which was a mental health hospital, one of the first that was founded in Europe in the 13th century. And what I wanted to draw attention to here is this is a very famous work. It's a very famous series. Um, but what we're seeing here is a, is a scene from a, um, from a mental health uh, institution. And I wanna draw attention to sort of the way that, uh, that mental disability gets represented in art. And, you know, there's some very obvious signifiers of, of mental disability, but then there's some that, that really we w might not consider disability if we were thinking about it today. And what I think that's very interesting about that is it really, um, it forces us to understand that disability as a category is quite socially contingent, historically contingent. What constitutes disability is always specific to its time. Um, and some of the very obvious things that we see, for example, if we see to the, to the left of the print, we, we see a, a man uh, looking reverently up at a cross. Uh, in, the, in the second room, we see another man with a crown on his head. Um, uh, it seems to be Hogarth is depicting delusions of grandeur. But we also see, for example, this, this uh, in the center, this man who is drawing a globe on the wall. Um, and this is a really interesting point because what Hogarth is drawing attention to was what was known as the longitude problem. And the longitude problem was in the 18th century, this, um, this huge issue of uh, that sailors were facing. So sailors could track themselves through the latitude so they knew where they were um, um, sort of going uh, north and south in relationship to the globe, but they couldn't track themselves uh, longitudinally. So they didn't know how, where they were east and west from the prime meridian. So sailing was quite dangerous because of this. And there was a prize out during this time to be able to determine uh, how to locate where you are in the world through the, the longitude. <clears throat> but it became such, it became a spectacle in uh, the 18th century to the point that anyone trying to figure it out was considered to be uh, mad uh, and was uh, perhaps scheming against you. So we have this figure here who's drawn the globe on the wall and he's trying to map out the longitude and to solve this problem. And Hogarth has situated him within the madhouse, um, but actually it's, it, is a, it was eventually discovered and it is a, you know, a valid intellectual inquiry. But at its time, um, it, it was a sign of madness. It was shorthand for Hogarth to depict madness. Um, and I'm going to pause there, Leon, and let you maybe jump in. Before, um. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks for starting us off with this image. Um, I think, you know, there's so much to be said here. Um, you know, as Connor mentioned, this is really one of the kind of most famous and kind of iconic depictions within like Western European art of the kind of concept of madness, particularly as it gets defined at the beginning of what we might think of as kind of like the modern period, early modern period. Um, and I mean, yeah, so I, mean, I think a number of things maybe we could think about here, um, also as a way of maybe setting up the conversation um, through the following works that we'll be looking at. Um, you know, it's striking. Uh, I did get a chance to look a little bit ahead of time at, at these images and what was sort of striking was the way in which the kind of institution or the asylum or the hospital 
um, or the kind of mental psychiatric institution sort of figures in each of the works that we're going to be kind of discussing, um, although in di very different kinds of ways, right? So this is obviously the most kind of um, concrete maybe depiction or representation of a sort of uh, mental asylum that we'll encounter. Um, but at the same time, uh, this particular version is highly theatricalized. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things that we might think about is how, you know, Connor was talking about the kind of historical definition of disability being very, very contingent and um, very kind of changeable depending on historical uh, context and, and kind of uh, cultural context. Um, but one of the ways I think we can trace that history is actually through depictions of the status of the asylum as a particular kind of space. Um, and it's a particular kind of space where um, I think we could think of different forms of uh, seeing, different ways of um, kind of perceiving uh, the world get kind of played out and contested. Um, the asylum is a space for kind of containment, um, but also for display. Um, you know, Connor mentioned the term spectacle. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that's really notable about this, kind of famously notable about this image is its theatricality. And I think that there is a lot of um, kind of scholarship that suggests that um, Hogarth was actually drawing upon his experience going to the theater um, and seeing plays actually that were being performed during this period where the, um, the, the figure of madness or the, the madhouse actually does take on this kind of symbolic uh, meaning, right, for uh, various kinds of Jacobian dramas. Um, so that's, that's very interesting in itself, the kind of theatricality that we see on display here. Um, and the other thing that this image depicts actually is um, the act of this kind of aristocratic um, asylum tours that did actually happen at, at uh, Bedlam um, during this period where sort of, uh, you know, the wealthy elite would uh, pay a certain amount of money to go um, visit asylums such as Bedlam in, in London and sort of see the ravings of, of the people who were confined there. Um, and so there was this kind of um, almost performance uh, aspect to Bedlam itself, um, in addition to uh, madhouses being really prominently depicted on theatrical stages during this period as a kind of metaphor for um, the dangers of uh, kind of moral waywardness. Um, so I think, you know, that's another thing that I would be interested in tracking is how the kind of space of the asylum um, shifts and changes over time because we know that it's, uh, you know, how, how the asylum and the space of the asylum has uh, been laid out, has been represented and depicted, um, tells us a lot about um, sort of shifting attitudes toward what madness or kind of mental illness um, even is or means. Um, so that's, you know, maybe a couple of thoughts, <laughs> but if you have further follow-ups, I'm happy to kind of talk about any of that more. Yeah, well, I, 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 I want to follow up and we might continue forward with it, but I'm so happy you mentioned place because I think this also is of all that we will look at the most specific place that we're going to be looking at. So the, you know, Bethlehem is a, was a real place. Um, it existed for centuries as a, you know, as a, as a mental health asylum um, through various sort of ways that that was interpreted over the centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some really uh, specific reference points here so that we know what we're looking at and the viewer would know what we're looking at. So when we look at Tom Rakewell, for example, his pose actually mirrors a pose of a sculpture that is at the entrance or was at the entrance at the time um, for this institution. And the institu uh, there, there were two statues um, uh, by a, a, a sculptor named Sipper, a, Dutch, a, a, a Belgian sculptor named Sipper, and these statues depicted um, a melancholia and, and then um, mania or the ra uh, raving uh, is the other way it's it's defined and and Tom Rakewell was was modeled off of the of the um of the statue for raving so it really is touching on a lot of reference points and then also that you mentioned which I think is very important it's 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 theatrical in nature but it's also depicting a scene of what we might call popular theater as you as you mentioned so the penny visits we see them here these two women uh, which was a practice where you could pay a small fee and you could come in and you could you could look uh, for entertainment purposes at, at the people in the asylum um, it also was pedagogical in the sense of 
of um, you, you know people could learn or follow what the, the the doctor in the facility would be doing as well and that practice ended in 1770 so a little bit after you know a couple of decades after this work but I'm really glad that you highlighted both those points I think those are very important points of the print um, but I'm going to move forward so we're going to move to the next slide now I didn't hear that. Was that? Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so this next print that we're going to look at um, is, is a print by Michael Mazur. So we're jumping up a number of centuries. Uh, Michael Mazur is an American artist. Uh, he actually taught at RISD uh, for a couple of years in the early 1960s, around the time that this lithograph was printed. Um, and, and what we see in this print is we see a figure whose hands are uh, bound by, by cloth or wrapping. Uh, the figures whose, whose identity is rather anonymous because he's, they're obscured, uh, their face is obscured, uh, but their knees are pressed together and their legs are splayed. And I'm, th I find this print in particular to be quite arresting because the way that the figure sort of fills up the space, they're both confined by the sheet that they're, they're printed on, um, yet within that confinement there's this uh, expression of movement or trying to find ways to move despite that confinement. So you know you have the, the wrapping of the arms, um, yet this person has uh, presumably is swaying back and forth um, and their legs are really extending up trying to maybe occupy that space as much as possible. <clears throat> so I find this, this work to be incredibly moving and it comes from a body of work that Mazur was working on during this time. And Mazur produced two sort of portfolios. One is images from a closed ward and one was images from a locked ward. Uh, this is a print that is related to the latter series, images from a locked ward, though it's a, a subsequent print where he added color to it. Um, but these prints were uh, are really interesting. So, so Mazur was, um, he spent some time in, in two mental health institutions. So when he was an undergraduate in, um, in, in Massachusetts, he went to a, a veterans, um, a VA hospital, and he spent time there. And it had a very profound effect on him, seeing the conditions, the social conditions of, of, of of the disabled veterans in those spaces. And then when he came to Rhode Island, he went to what was the, um, the Institute of Mental Health in Howard, Rhode Island, uh, which is just south of Cranston. Um, and there he worked and, volu and volunteered as an, um, as an art therapist. So he was working with the patient populations. And then when he went home, he would draw from memory, sort of reflecting on the situation that he had observed. So a lot of these aren't based off of, of, of a live model. Uh, he would maybe, he would eventually push more towards that, but he's really trying to get towards the emotional quality, the sort of the emotional tenor of the experience that he was witnessing. Uh, and I think he really achieves that really nicely with the really like the thick way that the lines are and how they're quite uh, energetic um, and, and expressionistic and sort of detail, not so much an individual, but sort of the emotional qualities of an individual in a particular situation. Um, and, and Leanne, I want to sort of bring you back in before I, you know, keep going. Um, if you've had anything you want to to say about this work. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I, I think that the description that you gave was really um, uh, vivid and remarkable. I, I find this, this piece really striking um, and the body of work that it comes from is incredibly interesting. Um, you know, I think as a, you know, maybe to follow up on the discussion of um, how Hogarth represents the space of the asylum, right, in the early 18th century, right, which you might think of as being on the very cusp of uh, you know, a kind of medical paradigm for understanding um, mental illness. Um, and, uh, you know, that uh, being on the cusp of that moment um, really is accompanied by a sense of the asylum as a space for, as a kind of therapeutic space. So the idea is that um, confining uh, people to a specific space and um, creating certain kinds of spatial configurations um, in a really kind of uh, uh, almost carceral uh, uh, format, form or format, um, has a kind of therapeutic effect. 
Um, and, you know, Hogarth is sort of at the beginning of that idea. And I think what's really interesting about the Mazer pieces is that, that they can be maybe understood as coming at the very end of the um, era of that understanding. Um, you know, we might think about the kind of larger historical context of what's been called deinstitutionalization, um, which is a process that occurred, um, you know, it was not, not a kind of unified or unitary process um, in different kind of national contexts, but we think of the era of just generally think of the era of deinstitutionalization, um, where these kind of like warehousing of people in large state run asylums is generally being from like the 1950s to the 1970s. Um, and um, it happens, you know, differently for um, the mental health field that happens earlier kind of in the 1950s. And then for um, institutions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that actually happens kind of later in the 1970s. Um, but thinking about this kind of end historic, the end point of the historical moment, which is not to say that institutions in any way have gone away, but that there was this kind of um, political movement to deinstitutionalize um, these kind of large state run, um, you know, kind of places. Um, and thinking about Mazur as um, being really interestingly kind of situated at the kind of tail end of um, the, the era of institutions we could, we could think of. Um, you know, another interesting thing to think about um, here, and I wanted to actually give a shout out to a new book actually by a colleague and, and friend of mine named Liat Ben Moshe, uh, B-E-N-M-O-S, H E, um, who uh, has a new book out called Decarcerating Disability, actually, which I have it right here. Um, I highly recommend it. And it sort of looks at the history of um, how uh, these kinds of institutions were uh, essentially decarcerated um, and what, what were the kind of politics around the kind of decarceration of disability um, during this period. Um, and one of the things that um, Liat talks about in this book is how kind of the, uh, new forms of visual representation of what kinds of things were going on in these asylums in the 50s. So, you know, kind of photojournalistic exposés. Um, there's also the very famous documentary film, um, Titty Cup Follies by the uh, documentary filmmaker Frederick Wiseman that was filmed in the 60s right around the same time that Mazur was um, doing, making um, his, his images um, in, in the Rhode Island asylums. Um, or institutions, um, and how the kind of mass um, exposure or like the kind of exposure of these images to a wider mass public really brought a lot of attention to the forms of kind of abuse and neglect that were happening in these institutions and was really kind of um, important to the movement to decarcerate and deinstitutionalize. Um, it's a really complicated and um, ambival historically ambivalent um, kind of question, the, the whole question of deinstitutionalization and decarceration because we know that there's all kinds of ways that um, disabled people and um, people who live with mental health um, or with mental illness uh, still face the uh, repercussions of um, living in a kind of carceral society and one that incarcerates people with disabilities. Um, but um, I think that Mazur's work um, is a really striking kind of um, uh, testimony and um, uh, from that from that moment or from that era or maybe a witnessing um, we could think of uh, yeah and I'd like to I want to follow up on two points so first I want to just sort of expand on what you had mentioned say that because you, you mentioned the medical model and I just want to want to sort of like flesh that out a little bit for people that might that might be new so the medical model of disability is one way of, of approaching disability where seeing disability as a problem to be cured and fixed and in the absence of a cure or a fix incarceration or institutionalization was a way to 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 deal with that um, and that held sway for a long period of time. You know, we can think from Hogarth. I think there's many ways that the medical model is still very active and alive today. Uh, but I do, I'm also glad that you mentioned, you know, the deinstitutionalization and Mazur is working really at a time, really in that window that you'd mentioned, the 50s to the 70s, where we see that movement really gaining prominence. And to give some teeth to that, to, or some context for, for everyone, you know, in the United States, deinstitutionalization led to uh, roughly 550,000 uh, Americans um, being uh, decarcerated or deinstitutionalized um, from, from these 
um, these spaces. So it was a really this sort of mass exodus. Um, but as you also sort of suggested, it, it's a really complicated um, celebration, right? At one point, it was the, the moving out of these spaces. But at the same time, in the United States, then we see the rise of mass incarceration. Uh, and so it, it, it becomes, you know, moving from the asylum into, you know, into the prison and, 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 and incarceration in those places. Um, and that's maybe a conversation for another day. But what yeah. I do really also like about these works, what I think Mazur is aspiring towards, and by maybe not working with a, a specific model in these cases, is humanizing these uh, people that would have been out of view and out of sight for so many people um, and really drawing attention not to an individual but really to a system an unjust system and um, using representation to really highlight those emotional and um, expressionistic qualities mm -hmm. yeah i think that um well just a couple of quick things that yeah i mean i would just say that liat kind of provides a really interesting kind of counter narrative to what i think has become a kind of popularly accepted, um, you know, argument that with the decarceration or the deinstitutionalization of mental illness, there was the consequent rise of mass incarceration. And I think it's a, it's a little bit more of a complicated story that I would highly recommend Liat's book to kind of give a maybe fuller picture of, um, she, she has a really interesting argument about, um, you know, what's actually really going on in that transition. Um, but I also want to say that, yeah, I think that you're right that this focus on um, there's a, maybe a kind of humanist dimension that's at work here that perhaps is, I don't want to say like fully absent in the, um, the Hogarth from, you know, uh, 17, the 1730s, um, but it's a, it's a different uh, kind of mode of representation, right? I mean, in Hogarth, the figures depicted, even though there are, you know, human figures represented, they almost have a kind of allegorical function. So they sort of represent, it's like the madman as a representative of the wayward, um, you know, the, the kind of wayward, uh, like bourgeois subject, maybe we could say in the in this 18th century. Um, or, you know, there's each um, kind of uh, figure in the Hogarth um, uh, image actually kind of represents a certain typology or type that might have been recognizable, maybe in part thanks to um, the kind of theatrical conventions that um, Hogarth is actually referencing. So it's almost if um, madness or mental illness in the Hogarth kind of has this kind of metaphorical or symbolic or allegorical function to it. And I think that that's something that in the Maser is not so much the case. Um, it's really about depicting a kind of um, emotional, um, yeah, like truth or something about the, um, the the real people who he observed incarcerated in these institutions. Um, so I think that there's um, a kind of uh, difference there. I don't want to, you know, I don't think that the Maser is necessarily free of, you know, problems of representation, right, that come from, you know, the, the issues of representing such experiences, right? I wanna say that it, it's a kind of more authentic representation necessarily. Um, but I do think that that's like an interesting kind of contrast between um, the kind of two pieces that we've been, uh, that we've seen so far. Yeah, and I think, and not to harp too much on, on these two when, so we can move forward, but thinking of Hogarth, we think of moralism, right? And there's mm -hmm. these, and, and types come with a moral baggage to them. And so Hogarth was really thinking about excess and ex, the excesses and yeah. how that leads to, you know, moral failure. Right. Uh, and maybe just to, to clarify too, that this image is, is at the end of a series of eight, I believe. Right. Um, and, and so this is kind of like, well, see what happens if you, you know, right. stray from the moral path as you end up in, in Bedlam, right? So the, um, the asylum is a, a kind of like uh, the bad place ultimately where, where this figure kind of ends up because he, uh, he, he sort of gives into his kind of wayward tendencies and desires. Yeah, and then going back to your, your recognition of place, I think uh, for better or for worse, there's a placelessness to these prints that we look at by Mazur. Mm -hmm. you, the, the specificities of what, what we're looking at isn't quite there like Hogarth is. I think that comes, like you said, with its own baggage. It could, you know, it could be, um, you know, I've shown these to students and, and there's, you know, recognition of, of sort of the, the humanistic quality to them, but then there's also the potential for a trafficking in the spectacle of someone else is suffering right and sort of, yeah. of, of, of moving through that and I think that's that's something to, to keep in mind as we look at these yeah, the agency absolutely. for who is being represented 
Yeah, absolutely. And and also um, maybe to to make a connection to the um, your your really nice uh, des description of what the medical model is. You know, how is it that even in these you know, very like impressionistic, you know, um, emotion laden kind of images, um, there's still a certain uh, kind of objectifying gaze maybe at play, right, that um, replicates that of like the medical gaze. Um, even though they might seem to be doing very different things, you know, there's still a certain, um, you know, direction or a way of looking that uh, involves a kind of exchange of power between, you know, artist and subject or between, for example, doctor and patient. Um, and I think, you know, both, both, uh, both pieces we've looked at so far are kind of navigating that, um, that question. Hey, so I'm going to advance slides now. And, and so we're moving to some sort of different forms of representation and these will be a little bit a little bit more challenging, I think, to unpack and their works that I'm thinking about still more actively. Um, but what we see here is a brown sheet of paper with a, a series of rather you know, abstract marks made in graphite. And the marks range from, you know, very simple lines that are faint to, to quite dark. Um, and also, if you look closely, you'll see a number of circles. And these circles have been worked over and over again. Um, sometimes they've been crossed out. Um, and then the, the lines that are at times connecting them, times not, you, you also see these, um, even these like sort of lighter back and forth scribble marks that are going over them. Um, so it's a very abstract composition and it's a work by Marit Cohen. Marit Cohen was, um, was born in Russia in 1945, so right at the end of the, of the war. She was uh, to a Jewish family and they, um, they were, you know, refugees until they sort of made their way to uh, what was at the time the Palestinian mandate and then eventually became Israel. Um, and she grew up quite, um, quite poor, uh, but she always was sort of drawn to drawing um, and, and was quite a prolific artist, even from a young age. Um, and she gained a lot of attention in her younger years and she um, and received a lot of training from, from people in, in Israel, um, including showing, winning awards, drawing awards as a child, both in Japan and in Israel. Um, and as a young adult, she got a, a scholarship that brought her to the United States in the 1970s to study art. And she lived in the United States from 19 1970s to her death. And I would just like to say trigger warning for those of you, um, uh, for those of you here that this will discuss suicide. Um, so I'll give you a moment in case people want to pause. But what I'm think, why I think this is really important to think about and think about in the context of disability is I'm often thinking about how narrative of artists can over-determine sometimes the meaning of their work. Uh, and so sometimes when we know the conclusion of an artist's life, we sort of write it all back into their work. And at the same time, we don't want to discount what someone was going through in their life and how it might manifest in their work. Um, but for, for Marie Cohen, it really brings up a lot of, um, I think, important Point. So this was a drawing style that's quite emblematic, I would say, of her work, especially in the 1970s. Uh, she really does a lot of these sort of circles and lines, and um, it's quite um, geometric and almost machinic in its qualities. Um, and she also worked in painting and um, would paint on wood in very sort of abstract and, and visceral ways. Um, and she did suffer from uh, mental health issues throughout her life. Um, and in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, she did LSD. And at one of the times that she did it, uh, it was given to her without her knowledge and she had a psychotic episode. Um, and when she was hospitalized for that episode, um, you know, that someone came to see, ask the doctors to release her from the hospital and they said can you but look at her drawings there's no way we can let someone out who makes drawings like this and they were trying to explain that's how her drawings always were right so it wasn't necessarily related to this episode or not um, and she ultimately she committed suicide in uh, in 1990 and in her letter she indicated that part of the reason for her suicide was that she had lived 
as a chronically ill person her entire life, um, and that that was that she was not in, a, in what she described the right state of mind, and part of that was an invocation because she wished to be buried in a Jewish cemetery uh, and not on the outskirts of it. So she want, needed to frame her her death, her suicide, as coming from this. Um, so I think this presents a really sort of interesting, compli not complication, but an interesting way to think about when we see disability and disability representation. Because um, I don't think, like I had mentioned, her style of drawing, which we see here, is quite consistent throughout her career. Um, yet we do know that she suffered with, uh, from mental health issues throughout her life and, and which ultimately um, led to her, um, her death by suicide. And so Leanne, I will let you Maybe I know this one might be a little bit harder to jump in on. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, I think, yeah, there's like a lot to be said here. And I think it it's a really, I mean, it brings up so much about, um, you know, so many things that I think um, are important to think about from a kind of curatorial perspective, um, as well as from, you know, the perspective of um, a kind of art critical or art history perspective, like how do we, um, you sort of, you know, understand the relationship between the biographical and the, you know, the formal aesthetic qualities of, of, of an artist's work. Um, and I think, you know, this also really is an important example of how disability can, um, I think, provide uh, an important way to um, open up that conversation about the relationship between the biographical and the kind of aesthetic or formal. Um, because I think, uh, you know, there's a number of um, you know, uh, points that we might bring up that I think you sort of touched upon. Um, one of which is that we don't want to sort of uh, risk reiterating the gesture of always viewing the art of people who we know biographically had a kind of relationship to some kind of mental diagnosis or even, you know, lived experiences of mental illness that, that may have in many cases caused great suffering. Um, you know, we don't always want to kind of view their art as a kind of symptom or pathology of that uh, that that um, that experience, um, because again, that can you know risk kind of reiterating some of the medical logics um, that are indeed behind the kind of carceral um, experiences that you know Marie herself actually did you know encounter when she had that these kinds of experiences of psychosis where she was institutionalized briefly on, on several occasions. Um, so we don't wanna, um, you know, or I, I'm interested in how we can find ways of, um, you know, kind of disrupting that narrative a little bit or not so easily going along with the sort of logic of the kind of medicalized or pathologizing framework, um, while also not discounting the very real kind of, um, you know, experiences that this work comes out of. Um, so I guess the question might be, you know, how do we approach this work differently? What do we, how do we sort of like think about what formal kind of qualities it, it brings to the table that are um, interesting and innovative and, you know, not a kind of symptom of some kind of underlying distress, but actually doing something with, you know, um, line and form and shape and, you know, the uh, relationship between the kind of horizontal and vertical, right? Um, you know, one thing that that is often, I think, discussed in terms of this artist's work is her relationship to kind of writing and seeing these kind of scribbles or scratches as a sort of um, like unreadable script or a kind of private language. Um, you know, and I think, uh, again, there, that's a kind of common trope for talking about so-called outsider art or art brute um, that, you know, draws on these kind of romanticized notions of the relationship between, you know, artistic genius and madness and, you know, um, uh, so in the, I think in the criticism of some of this work, you can see the legacies of those ways of thinking, um, saying like, oh, this is like a kind of inscrutable writing that she's just kind of writing to herself. Um, but I think that there could be some other ways of interpreting this that don't so easily fall into those kind of like um, familiar narratives that um, tend to, um, you know, not give um, works like this, you know, the kind of artist artistic autonomy that works by people who's, uh, maybe didn't have a kind of biographical relationship to um, a lived experience of um, mental or psychiatric disability. Um, you know, so I think that um, we want to think about ways that we cannot replicate ableism in our ways of curating and, and writing about um, works like this. 
Great. Um, and I want to just sort of address two comments that we got that sort of pick up on what we said. So Natalie Wright wrote, I'm so glad to be present in a conversation where this isn't considered, quote unquote, outsider art. And then a uh, following comment, uh, Rana Hammer said, uh, not scribbles, representations of concentration camps. Her mm. parents were survivors. It's in her blood. And these were two things I also wanted to pick up on. And I'm going to move forward to just some details of these work so we can, this work so we can see it. Um, but what I want to talk to your, to your credit, Leon, also thinking about um, the curatorial uh, need behind this of sort of unpacking this work. Because um, what I think we see with Hogarth, uh, we see a one dimensional figures, right? We see this narrative that's going to come to the end and everything is sort of what we can anticipate from beginning to end. Um, and then with Mazer, we still see one dimension of this person. We see them suffering in an asylum, right? So we, it's, we, we don't really get access to the full picture. Um, and for both of these, you know, I think, I think we do have to contend with the fact that her work has gained intelligibility in the art world because of art brute and because of you know outsider art um, and so art brute was something started with uh, Jean Dubuffet in the 1940s um, sort of celebrating uh, untrained art especially art by people with uh, with mental health uh, disabilities um, also children uh, sort of anyone that didn't have any formal training in art and sort of looking at it as a, a pathway back in and then outsider art was an English translation uh, the English version of that that came in the 1970s um, but I think the point also about you know her background um, is really important here, and I think it's also you know that trauma and generational trauma is also an important part to pull out. And I think if we look at these lines and you look at these you know lines connecting these circles, uh, it does look like a grid. It looks like separation, right? Uh, you can read a body into that, um, and I also think. What's different about this versus maybe what we would see in abstract expressionism or other sort of abstract movements that were being celebrated in a few decades before um, is maybe what we would call the personal, that there's a sense of the personal or the autobiographical, even if we can't access it. Uh, and that's what I love about what we see with these details is, is you can envision her hand sort of working as she's drawing out these lines and these connections and then she's modifying them. Um, and it, it, it suggests a narrative or it suggests something, at least to me when I'm looking at it, and, uh, this intention. Uh, so it takes me to the like to the edge of legibility, but it doesn't let me in. And I think that's a really, uh, I think that's a really salient part maybe of, of the connection to trauma and being a Holocaust survivor. Um, you know, that trauma and pain can be uh, world shattering, right, and, and being able to articulate that. But it's also an experience that can't be shared with someone who wasn't in that space and didn't go through that. And I see her work as really maybe, a, for me, it's really effectively taking me to that edge of representation and leaving me there. And I think that there's something really important about, about that and really um, uh, significant. Yeah, no, I, and I, I definitely, um, I really appreciate the comment about um, the, the Holocaust kind of reference for her um, work. And I think that also, you know, um, allows us to make a connection with the previous works that we've been talking about, because we could also think about how the space of the camp itself, both the concentration camp, but then also the kind of refugee camp where um, she spent uh, some of her early years um, in, in Palestine. Um, you know, we could, you know, you could see maybe the layout, you know, this, this image as an almost um, overhead map, perhaps, of a kind of institution or space of, of the camp. Um, or you might see perhaps a reference uh, to possibly barbed wire, um, if you think about it as a kind of upright um, representation. Um, and, and also just to mention that um, I think the, um, the kind of revelation or the, the um, the, the, the history, the kind of historical kind of reckoning with the Holocaust that happened in the kind of immediate post-war decades um, was very present in the kind of uh, conversation about deinstitutionalization of psychiatric and mental um, institutions and, and uh, asylums in the 50s and 60s. And the kind of imagery of the Holocaust was kind of uh, very much in the discussion and in the discourse about the deinstitutionalization of mental um, uh, institutions. Um, so I think that that's a really important connection. And then the final point that I wanted to make was actually had to do with gender and thinking about 
how um, these kinds of critiques of psychiatric power and psychiatric authority, um, or maybe what I want to read is kind of implicit critiques of psychiatric authority in art from this period, actually has a really important kind of feminist genealogy and kind of feminist art history from this period, um, in part because you know, so many women artists were kind of associated with or kind of accused of being mentally unstable as a way of kind of discounting their artistic kind of ingenuity and originality. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a whole range of figures that we might think of from this period. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, the writings of um, Kate Millett. Um, also, the uh, there's a novelist and short story writer named Gail Jones, um, who I think is really incredible, but also has a really kind of complex relationship to both uh, the sort of racialization and gendering of um, kind of psychosis um, as a source for art. Um, so I just wanted to kind of flag that and think about how race and gender kind of both play into, um, you know, what art is considered, um, you know, within this kind of framework. And and I'm not going to, I'm going to just drop this and then I'm going to move forward, but I, also trauma being gendered, especially in yes, the art world, um, you know, it, um, and many women artists, I'm thinking also of Eva Hesse working mm -hmm. around this time of, of being associated with wound, right? And and, um, and that's why I think this work uh, uh, deserves being more richly discussed, right? And that's why I was started the conversation with the over-determination sometimes of meaning, mm -hmm. um, and, and just thinking about that, because I do, I agree, all these things are, are, gender is a really important facet to this part of the conversation. So in the interest of time, we're going to advance to the last work and maybe just spend a few more minutes on it. Um, I, I feel like I could keep going for hours on these, but um, uh, I'd, I'd like to leave some space for Q&A at the end. Um, so the, the last work I want to discuss is this work by Johan Garber, an Austrian artist. And what we see here is a, is a, a black and white, very graphic drawing. So we have a white sheet of paper uh, and it's full of all these lines and details um, done in uh, pen and ink. Um, and it's, it's a really quite dense uh, composition. It's called a church. It was done in 1984. Um, and I'm going to go to some details in a minute um, just so that we can really see uh, into this work because it's quite, it's really quite, um, it's quite hard to look at on the screen. It requires you to get up close and, 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 and look deeply. Um, but again, this is what I'm thinking also is about outsider art is what was mentioned. Um, and sort of the problematic relationship, I think sometimes with the term outsider art and getting associated with an artist. And maybe we might say ambivalent, um, uh, because it, it does bring, I think, in, what, in, the, in the more generous interpretation, it has expanded our understanding of, of who makes art and who makes good art or valuable art to look at. Um, and then, the, but the negative association comes with it is that it reinforces the inside and the outside, right? By making the category of outsider art, we, we, we put all sorts of people in that category and we can fold them into the museum and art spaces, but that term sort of always reinforces this distinction in training. Um, and I think that's important with this work. So um, Johann Garber is also someone who had, uh, uh, lived with uh, mental and intellectual disabilities. Uh, he's still alive and um, at, at a relatively young age, he, um, he moved full time into a mental health asylum in, in uh, Austria. Um, and he, he drew and he was a, an artist and he just, he makes images, uh, but his work was quote unquote discovered um, by one of his art therapists. And he, among a few other of his, his uh, colleagues were recognized for having making art of a different quality compared to the rest of the art therapy group. And I think I would like to just hold in mind a question mark placeholder there of what do we mean by, I'm still curious what the, what the qualifications were that set him apart. But he then became, um, um, you know, he has curated shows for this group. He has, you know, he has been represented by a gallery uh, and he's making these works. And then it also gets into this idea of training and what constitutes training. Um, so he wasn't trained in the traditional ways that we think of art training, but um, he did start to copy other like old master drawings, like for example, prints by Albrecht Durer. Um, and that's its own form of training. It's actually a, an art training that went back before we think of art training in the, in the contemporary sense. Um, but what I really just find so uh, rich about his work, and I'm gonna advance to the details if that's okay, 
is just the density of his line work and just the way that he really pulls us into this space. So this is called a church. And there are these reference points that seem maybe church-like that we're looking at a church and you can see the cross to the left. Um, but it, it's just, as you look at this, there's just this incredible amount of detail. And what I love is that it just teeters on the edge of, of, of depicting a thing, a church being representational, but then all of these sort of abstract or emotional qualities that maybe we, you know, it, it, I think it changes our way of vision. And, and we had, you and I had discussed maybe mentioning a few theorists. So I want to mention uh, Tobin Siebers' uh, disability aesthetics. Um, and Siebers is spelled uh, S-I-E-B-E-R-S. And his theory of disability aesthetics is really that disability has always been at the center of aesthetics, right? It's that it's always been there and that we have to draw it out. And once we see it, um, you, know, we, you know, we realize how foundational it is to aesthetic cultivation. But part of uh, disability aesthetics then is sort of seeing differently, at least that's how I interpret it. So that when you confront a work of art, such as this, it sort of breaks our conventions this, uh, of what is constitutes art or aesthetics or beautiful, um, it forces us with a, a different type of engagement. And I think it sort of opens our mind to thinking differently about what constitutes aesthetics or what constitutes art or beautiful. Um, and I'm going to leave it there and let you jump in before we go into the Q&A. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I don't actually have a whole lot to add about that. That was really, really well said. I mean, I think um, absolutely I share your um, and, and I, presumably the uh, some attendees um, uh, frustration and and um, just discomfort with the framing of, of outsider art. I mean, I understand that it's important, you know, as a category, you know, in whatever how people have thought about uh, art historically, but um, I do think that there are you know, it, it has also put a lot of limitations on how this work can be approached and encountered. Yeah, as like, um, you know, full of ideas and life and aesthetic invention and possibility um, and true kind of, yeah, in inventiveness. Um, and, um, you know, I just think that that's uh, such a, such a cr crucial point. Um, you know, I also think one of the other maybe topics that we could talk about in Q&A if people are interested in is like this, um, you know, that comes up in relationship to this piece in particular is the whole kind of context of art therapy or the sort of framework of art therapy. Um, and it, is art supposed to be therapeutic? You know, even art that is kind of, uh, you know, ostensibly made within a quote unquote art therapy or art therapeutic context, is that the only, is that the sort of horizon that we need to sort of stay within and what other kinds of possibilities could might we you know think of uh for approaching this work that moves beyond the kind of therapeutic right because you know we might think about yeah there's like a kind of complicated discussion to be had about um you know the place of therapy and the therapeutic within within art itself um and you know if some of the possibilities for disability aesthetics as Sieberus writes about it or you know even the kind of ideas emerging ideas of neurodiversity would be to say that you know uh the kind of medical or pathologizing framework is not the only and in fact quite a limited one um to use right to kind of think about these works and what they're actually doing um, so maybe that's, yeah, maybe kind of general, but um, I, I really appreciate everything that you kind of said about this piece. Yeah, I would love maybe one time we can have a follow-up conversation on art therapy, but um, I think we yeah. should, um, I'm going to stop sharing my slides right now, and I know we're really at the end of, of the hour, but I would love to just open it up to Q&A if, um, if anyone has any other questions, I'm going to stop sharing so everyone's screen becomes more full, um, but I can always share again if anyone wants to see an image. So are there um, any questions? And I'm going to read a question that, um, that just came up. So this is from Gregory Edmund. Uh, in regards to the term neurodiversity, what would you consider to be the difference between neodivergence and mental illness? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, thank you for the question. Um, uh, let's see, so neurodiversity and neurodivergence are really terms that first get developed and emerge from the autistic 
community, um, starting in kind of the late 1990s, but I think the concept has really started to kind of take off and develop in some really um, interesting ways, uh, you know, since then. Um, so initially neurodiversity was really developed to kind of think, um, it was almost uh, the people, like some of the early proponents of the term, it was actually first coined by this Australian uh, writer, Judy Singer in 1998, um, who, uh, actually was coming from the kind of eco ecology movement and thinking about biodiversity as a kind of framework and proposing neurodiversity as a sort of analog um, for thinking about, you know, um, all the different kinds of um, forms of neurological personhood and ways of being um, that exist and that there's, there wasn't really a concept to um, talk about that outside of a kind of medicalized framework. Um, I think, you know, since it's emergence in the from the autism community and autistic communities, it started to be, I think, really taken up to describe a whole range of, yeah, as you say, kind of psychiatric, neurological um, uh, disabilities and forms of like mental illness as well. Um, so people like um, have been talking about it in relationship to experiences of schizophrenia, um, even depression, you know, t issues of attention and learning disabilities. So I think it's, you know, take, being taken up in a series of um, really innovative ways, right? I mean, I think what's important to keep in mind is that neurodiversity as a framework is not sort of denying um, the, you know, um, the fact of disability and disablement. Um, it's not supposed to, it's not, you know, substituting a kind of difference model for a disability model. It's still very much, I think, rooted in principles of, you know, um, disability justice, disability studies, or at least the, the, the version of neurodiversity that I'm interested in is really rooted in a, a conception of disability justice. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I think that the question of the relationship between, for example, mental disability and mental illness and where those lines get drawn, um, you know, is a long conversation that has to do with, you know, the history of science, history of medicine and psychiatry, how those distinctions have been made, um, often having a lot to do with histories of um, actually the kinds of institutions and treatment paradigms. So, for example, you know, what conditions are thought of as quote unquote treatable or curable versus, you know, what conditions such as, you know, um, uh, uh, intellectual disability that are thought of as just in need of kind of custodianship, like you can't actually get treated or cured from, um, you know, uh, certain uh, uh, forms of neurodivergence. Um, and so I think the ways that those are defined are also kind of um, shifting and kind of historically contingent. So that's like maybe a very long way of answering that question, but I think it's a really important issue to, to bring up. And then Leanne, I'm going to now, we have a few questions that I'm going to try to address and I appreciate all these questions, but um, uh, Courtney Long has raised her hand. So I think she's going to ask a question in real time. Hi, thank you so much. Um, just quick way of introduction. Um, I'm Courtney Long. I'm the acting assistant curator of prints and drawings at the Yale Center for British Art. And I just want to first thank you both so much for a really, really fantastic and engaging conversation. Um, my question really has to do maybe with the um, time span from Hogarth to now and, um, and the issue of spectacle and disability. And this is you know, very uncomfortable, I think, to talk about, but it's, it's interesting in Hogarth that the, the mode of representation is about the spectacle of the individual and that there's an othering that is taking place and there is a, um, a you know, a displacement and, and almost a lack of humanity um, in, in his representations. Um, and I, I'm just curious in thinking about these, the later representations that you have been discussing and um, the issue of spectacle and and what, what do we do about art and representation and disability, especially when we're talking about art? Art in itself is a spectacle, right? It's something that's meant to be looked at. So I was just curious, maybe from a theoretical standpoint or a framing standpoint, um, how the two of you might address, and, and maybe Connor in particular in your exhibition, how you might be framing um, methods for looking at these objects and looking at them differently to um, not treat them as spectacle, but to engage with them as something that, um, you know, is, is not that, right? I, hopefully I'm making sense. <laughs> You're making perfect sense. And, and I, can, I can give you a partial answer for right now. So this show is anticipated for 2022. So a lot of these questions, including 
the checklist is still being determined. But really the, the premise of the show is, is what I've thought about too is so many times when I've mentioned this interest of mine, people that can't think of examples of disability in art or, uh, or popular culture. Um, and when you look and you start to pay attention, you really do see all of these representations. Sometimes it's expect a spectacle like Hogarth, but if we go even a little bit earlier, we see a lot more religious texts and the emphasis on, on the miracle and the miraculous. Um, so I really, I'm, I'm trying to wrap the show around the, the different ways that disability emerges in art and its meaning in that context. Uh, and I don't want to run away from its negative connotations either, because I think that's an important part of the history. And I think we need to think about these, these representations. But it does, I do want to build a bridge from, you know, where we see these very sort of um, single-sided representations of disability that are quite narrow that serve some other purpose and in the in the, the the discussion of the in the labels for example I would like to draw attention to that like what is the the parameters of what we see how is disability being represented what is it doing in the context of this work and really unpacking that but I also then want to build uh, my hope my is that the show which was be relatively small, but we'll build to pride and really sort of find representation with either artists that identify as having a disability or a chronic illness and the way that that gets brought into their practice as well. Um, so I, I think this trajectory is important because I think it gives them, um, I do believe in the power of seeing yourself represented on a wall. I think seeing your, what, how you identify in an institutional space is very um, powerful um, and I want to therefore contend with this history and then how other artists have sort of taken claim of that identity and, and used it for very different ways. Um, so it's a very general answer to say that it's these are things that I'm thinking about and I, what I hope at the end of the show if someone goes through it is that they will see representations of disability in, in maybe the shows that they consume and think differently about it. Think about why it's happening in that moment. What is it doing? And is this really just some sort of shorthand that we've inherited from, you know, centuries of, of more negative representation? Um, I don't know, Leon, did you want to add anything? Um, I mean, that's great. I mean, I know that we're over time, but I would just say that, yeah, like, I think that, I think that's such a great question and thank you so much for, for um, asking it. I mean, for my, I always feel like where there's, you know, where there's power, there's also the possibility for resistance. And so I think what's interesting is that even in all of the pieces I think that Connor chose for us to talk about today, um, we could think about, yes, there are these kind of conditions of visibility that are being imposed on, you know, disabled artists or um, artists who are living in some proximity to a kind of um, medicalized diagnosis, whether that's mental or physical. Um, but I think we could also read, even in the Hogarth, right, um, or even in the Mazur, like, um, but particularly in the in the other um, you know works as well, these like glimmers of resistance where people are kind of disabled people are sort of pushing against the terms of their own representation maybe, um, or the um, you know they're they're asserting some kind of um, you know if not like full agency necessarily then there's like some pushback to the maybe um, you know a stigmatized or pathologized terms in which uh, the kind of field of the visible has been construed for them. Maybe we can do one more question. I don't know, Deb, are we doing, how are we on time? For well, <laughs> I would say this. Um, if people need to leave, they can leave. How about if we hang out, you, you do one more question and then we'll wrap it up. That sounds good. So, so Andrew, I see your question and I, 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 uh, I'm gonna read it. So Andrew, it says, if the work is part of, a, of someone's personal therapy, can the two experts discuss the ethics of therapy art being shared in a framework from therapy and shifting to a shared work of art for the community at large? Um, and I would love to have a larger conversation about that, um, but I'll just say that I think we do see shifts in you know art spaces that are centered around people with mental or intellectual disability of of giving agency to making their art and it's not necessarily therapeutic uh, in the sense of a cure um, but that many people find art making pleasurable um, and a lot of those spaces I'm thinking of um, 
Starlight, which is in Buffalo, which is where I was before. There's Cove in, in Rhode Island, uh, which is also empowering these, these artists, these makers to sort of make work and have be presented with a market and be able to determine their price and what they're making and how it's going out there. Um, so I, I, think, I think there are shifts between therapy framed as cure and um, art as an, in a context of, of being in a community and, and making um, works of expression. But Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, yeah, I also I appreciate this question as well, because I think um, particularly your question about the ethics of displaying art that was maybe, you know, produced in a certain kind of context, and maybe that was a kind of medicalized patient, you know, therapeutic context. Um, um, but I, I also think, you know, for me, what's limiting about the framework of therapy um, is that it tends to be a kind of individualizing um, perspective and, and um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of much more interested in how these practices can be thought of beyond the sort of like, oh, this is like my individual um, therapy that, that I'm sort of like working out between myself and the art, but actually, you know, how can we maybe I don't want to say like politicized, but bring out maybe a sort of larger social maybe context in which these kinds of works are being produced, right? Because I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, that's like a place that I'm, I'm more interested in, in, in exploring. Um, even though I think that, you know, the history of art therapy is like really fascinating and um, incredibly important and actually really understudied within um, the kind of history of art itself. So, um, but I, I appreciate like the kind of the question, even if I don't have a firm answer for you. I think I think we should maybe start to conclude. We should wrap up. Um, I, I, I'm just conscious of everyone's time. I just want to thank everyone for coming, and thank you, Leon, for for spending time with us, uh, and Rain and Heather for your for your assistance in making this accessible. Um, I really this was an amazing conversation. I think it could go much longer, uh, and I um, I hope we can have some sort of follow up to this um, soon. But thank you all. Yeah. Thanks so much, Connor. This was great.